I, I would like to have this presentation focus on uh, not necessarily the African mining vision per se, but what aspects of it would provide opportunities for women and uh, enhancing women's livelihoods. This is a discussion in which we are really looking at what women are, are, are needing. And so therefore this is an opportunity to look at one of those particular instruments at the continental level which might have a positive implications for women and, and, and women's livelihood. Before we go into the African mining vision, let's take a step back, look at what was happening beforehand. I mean, even as we look pre-independence, you know, what did minerals mean to most of our economies? It served internal economic needs. And even at that time, women were participating in mining in their own right. And you, you had um, women being not just serving mining, but also mining themselves, mining things like iron, mining things like gold, salt, clay. In some of these things, women were actually the leaders of the activity. Now when colonialism, the colonials came, it, it actually changed the shape of mining. It took the local labor, used it, and virtually increased the scale of mining. It required great, uh, greater technology, and by that way, people were moved away from mining. Women were not able to participate as fully as they used to. Because the products of mining were meant for their markets, it introduced a mass export of mining products. And so our countries, instead of mining for our own purposes, we were mining to support the industrialization efforts of the colonial masters. Now, when we moved from the colonial period and most of our countries gained independence, our governments realized that there was great opportunities in there. And so they took steps to change in terms of the control of the mining and nationalize many of these efforts. But this didn't actually change the form of mining. What it changed was the control of the mining, but it's still the mining was geared towards export, exporting the, uh, the mineral products. Then we fell into the debt trouble of the 1980s and 90s, and the, you had these Bretton Woods reforms that took place. And so the Bretton Woods reforms un introduced under the SAPS ended what we saw as the post-independence attempts and introduced new policy regimes. Again, these were geared at attracting FDI, it ended up ensuring that um, still the mineral sector had weak links with the rest of the economies. Minerals continued to be exported in their raw forms. And um, just like with the finance sector, nearly all the profits from minerals were repatriated. And for our states, the benefits of minerals became reduced to revenue in the form of taxation, in the form of royalties. And when you look at the size of what was being gained from mining, this was very minimal. There was a, quite a, a great deal of deregulation, and you've all had the term, a race to the bottom. So countries were competing with each other to make sure that they could attract as much foreign investment as they could by making the requirements um, for my, uh, investment very, very low. The outcomes. There was a huge inflow of foreign capital. We had a lot of money flowing into the mining sectors. But the foreign companies took away the bulk of these benefits, and our national governments had little money and little control. Our communities bore the brunt of um, the environmental damage. In some cases, mining companies destroyed the environment, ran away. The sector still continues to have very weak links to the rest of the economy, continues to operate as an enclave, and again, there's little what by way of processing or beneficiation as a result of the mining activities. In 2009, they adopted the African Mining Vision, a new framework for Africa's minerals and mining sector. It's a shift, essentially, from just revenue and export, and seeks to uh, promote economic and social development promotes the development of better linkages with other sectors in the economy 
and a better governance of the sector and environment. Again, kind of presenting opportunity for women uh, in terms of their livelihoods as well as for communities in terms of their gains from mining. Now, it's important to look at the question of linkages and diversification because that is, in a sense, how we can talk about structural transformation of our economies. If we want the mining sector to do much more than it already has done and contribute with, in terms of relating better to the other sectors, it's through these linkages that can be developed that we can look at it. It's not just about using it for the known minerals like that, the gold and diamonds and things. The AMV recognizes that the other minerals are extremely important and need to be developed. I'd like to now focus on salt as, uh, a, as an example of something that we can do. And I'll use the salt production in Ghana as my, as my basis. Now, salt has involved a long-standing role for domestic indigenous enterprise. It relies on the role of women and their skills. It's important for both household consumption and industrial needs. And it takes place, for instance, in Ghana, in lagoons, where it's formed naturally. So it's a very sustainable uh, mining enterprise. Salt uh, is formed when the dry season comes. It's there for collection. Women collect it. During the rainy season, the lagoon is used elsewhere. So you've always got that replenishing. And so in the past, there were attempts to stop the local women and communities from mining salt. All the way up into the 70s, you actually had situations of conflict where there were attempts to take over the lagoons and prevent the, the uh, local communities and women from mining. For example, even as we speak today, an Indian salt company has been given um, control over part of the lake. The locals are in no way being supported by local policy. How do we ensure that the women, especially in terms of salt, are supported and are, are taught how to better produce salt so that they can enhance their uh, economic opportunities. So what would we need to, to be put in place so that our, our women in the Keta area can produce and increase their production? And in what relevance would the CFTA have in helping the women retain their independence in the, in, in the face of the onslaught of foreign investors? Especially when we are looking at extractives and mining, we need to we need to fully I think appreciate the fact that the various aspects of a free trade agreement actually have implications for the entire mining sector. So whether it is the trading goods and services, whether it is competition, whether it is financial services, all these elements will have implications on how the mining sector uh, evolves. And and you realize that under the Africa mining vision. Uh, African countries made certain commitments in terms of uh, governance of minerals, uh, in terms of uh, participation, in terms of transparency, and we know that one area where things really are never done in the open is trade. And uh, so part of the question we also need to address is whether actually the free trade area creates any opportunities for enhancing transparency and accountability in the mineral sector. There are specific communities that are, that are directly impacted by mining activities. And therefore, what kinds of safeguards can you build in a free trade agreement to make sure that, one, the interests of these communities are protected, but also the actually their opportunities are expanded because sometimes we just focus on protecting the what is there. How do we use an instrument like a, a free trade uh, area agreement to actually expand the opportunities of those communities that are directly dependent uh, on mining activities?